Hey everybody, it's been a while since we've had one of these. We're finally back and about time to. And uh, all right, let's uh, let's get to it. I know it's uh, it's been a while since I've had uh, a video in general, let alone a follow up. But um, there were a lot of interesting points that people brought up in the comments of this video. Um, one of them that I think was a little weird is people talking about how I brought up, you know, how I was talking, you know, a bit business-like, and I'm sorry, if you're making a trading card game with the intent on, you know, publishing and selling, guess what? You're starting a business, so c keeping that in mind is kind of an inescapable thing, but, uh, anyway, I have a nice list here of some other things that some people brought up. Um, one of the interesting ones was, um... So one of the things people mentioned is that I failed to mention that a lot of these starter decks draw in their appeal by having like a really cool, like powerful, not necessarily good, but like capstone card, like a big shiny card that would draw people and make them interested. That is, um, it's something I mentioned a lot in my like supplementary videos, but I admit that's something I did not mention here, mea culpa. This is specifically things like the first edition Machamp or number 39 Utopia, which are some pretty iconic starter deck cards. Um, Utopia actually turned out to be good when uh, when it was first released. It was a pretty common sight in a lot of uh, a lot of decks. They do they do occasionally still put out things that are you know kind of good. Like it's the first like Crystal Beast deck we've gotten in a long time. Um, so failing to mention that Mea Culpa. Um, it's something I should have brought up. Having a big flashy piece of foil somewhere in your deck is a very good way to both draw appeal and make people feel like they got something cool because a lot of those cards often go on to be iconic like first edition Machamp. Um, so moving on to the next thing, why do I think it's okay to sell three starter decks at $10 a pop rather than one starter deck at 30 um, this is, again, from the business angle. A lot of people will tell you the most difficult thing to sell somebody is the first purchase. Um, I mean, you, you hear about this in some CD or video game circles. I know I talk about, you know, the business side of things, but I call out things that I find to be unethical practices when I spot them. Um, but in regards to this... Um, I honestly think that, you know, three decks at 10 versus one really good, like three, like basic decks, like Yu-Gi-Oh decks at 10, where you're only getting like one copy of everything versus like a fancy, like $30 deck where you get like a lot of copies of anything. Um, why do I think the three at $10 is better? Um, a lot of that is just the front end. The way it's something I'm going to talk about in my accessibility video in greater detail, um, but the most difficult thing to sell anybody is the first thing they buy. If you can get them to make that first purchase, it's a lot easier for them to buy into the other stuff. It's why I talked about specifically like the Pokemon starter decks, how they are specifically leveraged as like the first stepping stone towards more product. Like you buy the starter deck, then you buy like the fancy box or the tin that has another copy of the card from the starter deck in it to get you buying that collection. Um... Like I said, it's basic accessibility. It's basic, like, stepping stone procedure. A lot of people forget that that's what starter decks are for, is that they are an anchor point for people to start. They don't necessarily have to be the best, but they do not only allow people to play the game, but they give them a basic idea of how a deck should probably be put together. Although, again, Pokemon's maybe not the best example of that because they tend to build their, their starter evolutions on, like, a pyramid structure. Like, you get one of the best versus four of the base stage, whereas in actual decks, that's very, very different, let alone, like, trainer card quantities, although they've been putting more trainer cards in those decks. Um, but uh, having it be a lower price point, I actually refer to it as, like, a cover charge. Like, to go into a club, some clubs, they have, like, a cover charge. You have to pay, like, $10, $20 just to get into the club in the first place. Um, I talk about how you will attract a, a certain clientele with a really high cover charge, but... The club with the lower cover charge is going to have a lot more people partying inside of it. Um, so it's it's part of this, this mindset as well. Um, people don't necessarily know if they're going to like something. I know we live in the internet age, the information age, where anything you want to learn is at an arm's length. 
but sometimes you don't really know how you'll enjoy an experience unless you actually try it out. Like, I own a copy of Super Smash Bros. Melee, um, and even though I've watched a lot of videos on how to, to do it, I can't wave dash to save my life. My hands are too twitchy. You can't even talk about frame advantage with me because my fingers, you know, will... It's like I have to, like, brace myself to hit a button at a proper time. Um... I like the concept of fighting games. I like the idea of the back and forth, the frantic execution. I just can't do it. So I don't find it enjoyable, so I don't do it. Um, it's the same with card games. One of the things I've talked about is something called tabletop simulator syndrome, where uh, or TTS syndrome for short, where playing a game on tabletop simulators uh, is actually um, not, a, not an indicator of how well the game plays directly because everything in Tabletop Simulator is completely weightless and magnetic. Um, so a lot of the games that I see where it's a board made out of cards with more cards played on top of them, um, they might seem good in the virtual space where you have infinite space and everything is both weightless and magnetic, but try putting that in real life and it can be a bit of a pain. Um, people are a lot more willing to give your game a try if it would cost them maybe one sandwich as opposed to like three or five sandwiches. Um, also, I find that a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, starter decks like this, they should like only be like high price competitive products. Um, I hate to break it to you, but saying that the only products that should be released in like a complete state that people can just do a one and done buy to be able to play the game and saying that it should only be like expensive and competitive is gatekeeping. And that's not really something you want when the idea is that you are a company that sells a game that is best when it has as many people playing it as possible. You don't really want to gatekeep people like that. It's, it's, I think a lot of these game companies are taking ideas from like the worst members of the community. I feel the same way with Battle Spirit Saga. I feel like Battle Spirit Saga got its big marketing push being about paid competitive from people who are really obsessed with pay competitive, like top level competitive players. But I hate to break it to you. Top level competitive players is maybe 0.1% of your fan base. They're the one people who can pull off the jury Han counter attack against the fireball. Um, those are your competitive players, but they're not the majority of your players. So it's important to not forget that it's something I bring up in the um, accessibility video as well. Like, one I did mention in the starter deck video here are the $30 um, Shadowverse Evolve starter decks. Although, this actually isn't the $30 starter deck. It is the demo deck, which is basically identical to the starter deck. But rather than costing me $30, it cost me $11.50 after shipping. Yeah, um, $30 for the starter deck was not a great entry point. Um, the problem is that it's the only entry point. I mean, Pokemon has $30, like, structure decks as well, but those are, like, competitive decks that don't really have a lot of life left in them. They contain a lot of cards that are going to be rotated out fairly soon after that deck is released to give people a chance to play with a lot of power. Um, ha but they still have the $10 entry fee. They have a $10, a $20, and a $30 level of deck that you can buy like the $20 deck contains like more competitive cards you can get like shining greninja in there which a lot of people use um you know what a couple things about this people ask me where i got the $30 price tag from because like i'm not seeing it on sale for $30 it's not for sale $30 on the boucherard website and you know they're right it's not being sold for $30 anymore at the beginning when it was released Everybody had it priced for $30. Who had it priced for $30? Well, my local game store, for one. Um, you see in the video of me of the, the zoom in on that price tag, that is footage that I took at a local game store next to the Sylvie deck that I actually did wind up purchasing and pulling the CSR out of. Um, so yeah, I got the Sylvie CSR by supporting my local game stores. You should do that, everybody. But that wasn't the only place where I saw that total. I also saw it on this obscure website. You might have heard of it called Amazon.com. They had it listed for $30. And so did this other website called Takuga Player. Yeah, that's a joke. Those aren't obscure websites at all. Um, they are probably the two most prominent places where people would buy cards. That isn't a local game store. Support your local game stores. Um, but both of them had it listed initially as $30. Uh, 
However, the Bushiroad website has them listed as $20. And the way I see it is there's three possibilities for this. Uh, well, $20 for like direct purchase. At one point, all of the major retailers agreed that these decks were $30, which tells me that was the suggested retail price they were handed either by the distributors or by Bushiroad. So one of three things has happened. Either one, the number that Bushiroad is giving is the wholesale number, which is one possibility. It might not be. Number two, Bushiroad also at one point had them at $30, but then dropped them when they did not sell too well. Like I was able to get a copy of this game's Wrath of God for six cents, free shipping. Um, or number three, Bushiro just screwed over a ton of game stores, which gonna be great for them. Um, but that's what I talked about. A lot of people balked at the concept of a $30 starter deck, myself included. It's why I didn't buy it. It's why I went uh, behind their back and got myself a demo set, which is basically the exact same thing as a starter deck, just without the box. Um, oh, another thing. Like, I talked about the tokens. I talked about how they were plastic because, you know, they have, like, the, 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 the shining texture of plastic. They have the sound of plastic. They're as thick as plastic, but they're actually apparently paper? Um, yeah, there we go. They're paper. They're fake plastic. They fooled me, but, you know... I, I don't know what the point of these were. What was the point of making the tokens so thick? Um, like, I'm honestly convinced that, you know, this, this is the reason my local game store gave me as to why the, the deck was so expensive. It's like, oh, it has some really fancy tokens in here. Uh, <laughs> they're not that fancy, and they're definitely not worth, like, $15. Um, like I said, the high price tag frightened away basically everybody. Um... Although, Bushiroad has had some really weird stuff going on. Uh, one of the things that people mentioned was how Bushiroad... They basically, basically, they've divided their starter deck products into two camps. You either have the one camp where the starter deck is $35 and, you know, it comes with a storage box and sleeves and stuff. But, you know, I don't really care about that. Um storage containers are incredibly cheap sleeves you know i'd rather have my own sleeves people who play card games they already have sleeves so that's not really going to appeal to them at all also i don't care about any of that other stuff i cannot buy the starter deck without paying the full 35 dollars meaning that starter deck is 35 dollars um the other thing that came out that actually is a bit controversial is um the cheaper starter decks the 17 dollar starter decks Half of the cards are printed without ability text. And this is where I need to talk about some of the weird stuff that goes on with Bushi Road. So what they are talking about are cards that are uh, known as textless cards. I have a few of these from one of Bushi Road's other games, Dragoborn. Although you also see these in games like, um, like Legend of the Five Rings and Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering famously did them as like, you know, special, special promo cards, the, the textless cards. The problem was they didn't have any text on them. So even though a lot of popular cards got printings like Cryptic Command, they didn't have effect text on them. So basically, even though they were playable as cards and playable as their original state, they they didn't really work very well in a setting where maybe not everybody was familiar with all the cards. I mean, one of the cards is literally called Cryptic Command. Um, so they cause a lot of trouble. They're not really made anymore. Um... Bushy roads are a bit different. If you get textless cards for a Bushy Road game, they aren't like cute, fun alternatives that you can put into your deck to uh, play as like the the full effect card. No, if a card printed by Bushy Road does not have effect text on them, that card is treated as not having effect text. So cards like the Prismatic King or Zarko Savage which are good cards in Dragonborn. My promo versions, uh, these, the, the Prismatic King came from the demo deck and Izarko Savage came from the demo event. Because they have no effect text on them, they are basically vanilla monsters. That's, it's, it's the same as, uh, it's the same as these old, like really old, like original, original demo deck cards. Like it used to be like with Vanguard, they would hand you a two player demo set where the level three characters just didn't have any abilities. They just had the advantage of twin drive. So I think these cards were like only in those special demo decks. Um, but now they're making it so that you actually have to pay the privilege to play with 
uh, textless cards that you can't use with any effect. Bushiroad is really weird about stuff like this. Like, I remember Dragoborn, the demo deck, came with these, like, dice. They came with, like, some little dice. Uh, like, custom-tooled dice that had, like, a dragon face on them instead of a one. And they said... Uh, they, they, get, they went through the trouble of custom-tooling these dice, put them in demo decks, and then said, Oh, you're not allowed to play them. In fact, you're not allowed to use... Any dice, you have to buy the special starter deck dice in order to play. And those starter decks are $20 each. You're not allowed to use any alternative dice. You're not even allowed to use the dice that came in the in the demo decks. And we went through the time and trouble to make them distinct so that you couldn't tell. Um, it's the same with the leader cards in Shadowverse Evolve. There's a number of reasons I don't like Shadowverse Evolve. One of them is, you know, the naked physical attempt to replicate Hearthstone's... Um, Hearthstone's mana system where you have to like automatically tick it up every turn. Oh yeah, Bushiroad, I'm sure that's gonna work very well. Duplicate the mana system from Redakai. That's gonna just do so well for you. The other one is that it forces you to use leader cards. Um, but here's the thing about leader cards is they are one, required, two, scarce. They are either only in the starter decks or incredibly scarcely in booster packs, and three, don't actually do anything! They literally do not have any effects. Remember what I said before. This isn't like some sort of alternate art alternative card. If a card in Bushiroad has no text, it has no effect. So the leader cards, which are mandatory for play in Bushiroad's rules, literally don't do anything. Um, ugh. I mean, they're a little easier to find because a lot of people have sort of given up on the game. There were, of course, like, collaboration sets with, like, VTubers and stuff. Like, I know there is a Lapless Darkness card. Um, but that's just not good design. That would be like, um, in Yu-Gi-Oh! we have the Field Center card. Uh, the Field Center card, you're technically allowed to use anything you like as your Field Center card, as long as it fits two qualifications. One, it cannot be confused for an actual game piece, so you cannot use, like, a regular Yu-Gi-Oh card. And two, your opponent agrees to it. You could use a copy of Pokemon Red as your field center card if you wanted to. Um, it allowed you to have a lot of room for expression. You could doodle up your own field center card. You could, you know, create a mascot card. There's a lot of, a lot of weird, like, like, specially printed, uh, field center cards out there. Um, this would be like if Konami said you're only allowed to use special Konami printed field center cards, you must use a special Konami printed field center card, and they're like 20 bucks, so suck it up. I'm honestly not sure how Bushiro stays in business, and I honestly think that's one of the reasons that um, Grand Archive has kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because it feels like they are following in Bushiro's footsteps with those sorts of bad ideas. Like, you thought Vanguard was crazy with their $35 starter decks? Try $50. So what they've done is they've made like these special sets. Um, appropriately enough, one of them is for Sylvie. That include a starter deck. Uh, the cards develop the play set. So like 100 total cards. Three booster packs and a, a set of sleeves and a life counter. Uh, which I think is just like a 30-sided dice. Um contained in a storage box for 50 bucks i don't care about all the other stuff that's in there i cannot get the starter deck without spending 50 dollars. that is a 50 dollars starter set and that is bad design i vented my frustrations to them directly but we'll see if, if that gets anywhere heaven forbid any of those decks turn out to not be very good because then not only are they 50 bucks but they're 50 bucks and not even worth buying that that i worry is going to be a nightmare for somebody um what else did I have on here? Uh, that's a lot of it, actually. Like, like, like I said, a lot of the things I brought up about starter decks, I do have my videos about how Blankety Blank gets you to buy the starter decks. I don't know if I should bring that back. Um, like, lately, I've been a bit of a negative Nancy about a lot of these. Like, like I do not like these CSRs. Um, I don't have a problem with trying to convince people to buy two or three copies of a starter deck. It's when you get up to numbers like 70 that I have a problem with. Apparently this card is like one in 72 starter decks. And that I'm sorry is, is shameful. Um, like I think the biggest thing that the grand archive people have against me is that I didn't immediately brown my pants upon pulling this card. It's because I find this to be a disgusting concept. Um, 
I'm sorry, but it is. I did get some people who said, yeah, I pulled Omnimon from my starter deck booster pack, and that was one of the most incredible experiences. So, I honestly think that my statement that a bonus booster pack with a chance of a super rare inside is about as much fun as pulling a card. Because here's the thing, is it creates some fun memories for people, yes, but then you have the people who chase after these cards, which creates a problem when they just buy up all the stock. I had somebody say that they did, like, the special cards in one of the Bushiroad games that people were buying up the decks to try to chase them because you can't exactly return an opened deck can you um oh right i wrote this upside down on the clipboard for some reason about uh, about you know teaching people how to play a game because um a lot of times people don't understand how your game is um, because the tutorials on them suck. It's why I made the tutorial video on tutorials and why I had such, you know, a blowout of a game, you know, that, that just went crazy with all the things that happen in it. Um, I wrote it here as a nice succinct little thing. A tutorial should show not just how to play your game, but how fun it is to play your game. There you go. Nice, nice shot there. But yeah, that is... It's it's a lost art. Alongside the bonus booster pack, the fun, thrilling tutorial also feels like a lost art. They feel so robotic and awful. Like especially the Bandai ones. I know a lot of it is because of translation, and they 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 kind of get some some cheap voice actors reading poorly translated scripts. But there is so much that can be done to make the game fun. Like the old Naruto Bandai card game actually had the characters playing a game against each other. Um, it's an old Flash tutorial, so I'm afraid I can't really get any footage for it, but it was kind of neat. You, you, you used to find stuff like that all the time. Like, they had one of those for Naruto, they had one of those for Huntic. The Huntic one I have shown off, the Accelerators one, like I said, felt like a celebrity promo. There are so many ways that you can handle things. And like I said, um, starter decks are for people who are just starting out. They are ideally inexpensive, maybe not the best, but they would be inexpensive, um, to get people involved. One thing I forgot to mention is the difference between three decks at 10 and one deck is 30 is you have three decks worth of cards. And you know what that opens up? Deck customization. You get to, um, decide which cards need to have higher quantities, which cards can be dropped. Um, you can mess with ratios by picking up two more of these decks. You go out, you buy the cheap deck, you see if you like the actual experience of the gameplay and then if you do, you go and buy two more because you've already bought two on the front end. You can do it piecemeal. You can do it over the period of a couple of weeks if you're like a kid with allowance or something. And then you can start customizing a deck. So that's all of the fun stuff. So yeah, that is, uh, that's about all I have to say about that. I plan on having the accessibility video out hopefully before my birthday, which is a week from now. Um... So hopefully I can still crank out a quick birthday video. I have plans to go to a Star Wars pre-release event in this weekend. So maybe I'll see if I can get some footage from that. So yeah, big thanks to my patrons again. And until next time, this is Kodak signing off.